canal was going to be this, this beautiful thing. It was going to be an object of beauty. There would be boats on it. You could have gondolas that look like, uh, you know, the Venetians did. It was seen as a sort of community benefit and a beautification as well. And then at the same time, the um, landfill that created the dry land in that is now Waikiki was really going to be was seen at the time as being really what we would think today as a suburb. It was built as and it was sold as single family residences on small lots. So that's why Waikiki has traffic problems and that's why Waikiki is so crowded because it wasn't laid out to have a lot of big buildings. It wasn't laid out to have big resort hotels. It was built to serve, what, again, what I said is like a, a suburban community. So the streets are small and the lots were small because it was seen as people were going to have individual homes there. Well, again, there was no way to anticipate in the 20s what was going to be occurring decades later and how Waikiki would turn into a dense urban area. Today we have a very clear sense of what Waikiki is because we've got the division of the Alawai Canal and everything that's Mauka of that. And before the canal was built, the distinction between the two districts of uh, Waikiki and Mo'ili'ili was not very clear. So that area, in fact, in its natural state, was mostly wetlands. If you look geographically at the island of Oahu, you see that the Ko'olau Mountains, as most of us are familiar with, receive a lot of rainfall just because of the way the trade wind pattern usually brings moisture over the mountains, it condenses into rain. So we've got heavy rain in the mountain and then a lot of that moisture, a lot of that rain percolates down through the mountains and would, in its normal conditions before humans altered the landscape, a lot of that drained into Waikiki. Now, because there was all this fresh water there, uh, the area was used first traditionally by the Hawaiians for growing kalo, for growing taro, because taro needs to be planted in water. Waikiki as a marshy area could not be developed. Waikiki as dry land could be. The justification used by the territorial government was that Waikiki was unsanitary as a marshland. It smelled bad. Uh, it was potentially the source of disease. So this was part of a, a larger justification for health purposes. And even though I do not think any health problems actually ever arose in Waikiki as a marshland, you can read a lot of descriptions that say it did smell bad, meaning it smelled organic, meaning you smelled decaying things. And that indicated presence possibly of unhealthiness. Therefore, to get rid of that, we have to dig it all out, spread all this nice coral fill down and make it all into dry land, and then it is going to be more sanitary. At the time the Alawai Canal was built, there really were no environmental laws. I mean, the laws that we have in place today to not only protect the environment, but to be aware of cultural sites are very strong. In 1920, there were no such laws. The primary purpose for the dredging of the canal, the landfill that followed, was for economic reasons. It can't be said that people in the 1920s knew that when this was developed this way, it would turn into a gold mine, because really the property values took a really long time, decades, to gradually get up to where they were really valuable. So, yes, economic justification, but no, you can't read too much into it because, of course, the values really weren't there at the time. We can't judge it based on the values now as to what the values were when the LOI was constructed. A good chunk of Waikiki right at that same, right about that same time period had been claimed by the federal government either through condemnation or through people actually selling out uh, to create Fort DeRussi. So you've got the territorial government, you've got the federal government all saying this is what we have to do to the Waikiki district. That's an unstoppable force. When the canal was constructed, initially it was planned to be a complete circuit so that it would have been dug all the way out to the end to reach the beach. So that it would have been, in theory, fully open to circulation on both ends from the ocean. And that was considered to be uh, a more healthful situation where there, it wouldn't become polluted. Well, they never did complete that other end going out to the ocean where Kapahulu Avenue is now. 
there was some concern that the water was going to become stagnant to a degree. At the same time, the water flow through the streams down into the canal was going to be constant. So it wasn't seen as being a completely stagnant, completely unmoving, unhealthy move of mass of water. The film that we have at Bishop Museum is probably from 1924 and it shows people swimming for recreation in the Alawai Canal. And again to us today that's unimaginable because we think of that water as polluted, and it is, but it wasn't always that way. Frankly until I saw this film I didn't really know that people had gone swimming in the Alawai Canal so I was surprised when I first saw it. But you can see that there was that idea of using the canal for recreation. When the canal was first built, it didn't have the finished retaining wall and the steps that it has on it today. So in the film you see people clambering sort of um, uncomfortably over just this rocky edge of the canal to get down into it to swim. As a very little kid I always remembered looking at the stairways that are built into the embankment of the canal and thinking, whoever goes down those stairways, do they ever swim? What are those even there for? Well, you know, initially it probably was thought that people would use those stairs for possibly swimming or getting in and out of boats. And it's never really happened to that degree. But yes, people did use to swim in that thing. There's the whole sewer system problem, but the sewer system is separate from the Alawai Canal. The fact that the canal had to be used in an emergency as an emergency uh, sewer outflow was something, again, that couldn't have been anticipated sewer system put in in the 1920s or even later was not intended necessarily to take on more than 100,000 people who are now in Waikiki. One of the problems with the Alawai has been that the streams that come down into it gradually have had more and more junk put into them. There's runoff from roads, there's runoff from pesticides, there's runoff from these urban areas upstream in which unhealthy things are flowing into the streams and then down into the canal. There was no way to know in the 1920s that there were going to be pesticides. Pesticides didn't exist for the most part. So things like fertilizer runoff and that type of stuff, they hadn't happened yet. So there was no way to anticipate that that was going to occur. And that's one of the reasons that the canal is so polluted as to what's being washed into it. All of the street drains, from Waikiki, again, water that's flowing off the street into a drain and into the canal, that's nasty stuff as well. Not that many years ago, we went through a small-scale environmental disaster in Waikiki, fortunately rather confined, which was that uh, because of excessive heavy rain, the sewer system was damaged. And when the sewer system was damaged in Waikiki, which again has an immense amount of people in it, an immense amount of sewage, the damaged sewage pipes could not accommodate what was happening. There had to be an emergency rerouting of the sewer system into the Alawai Canal where the raw sewer sewage was just dumped into the canal to flow out into the ocean. And what that required was people to be kept out of the water, not only in the canal where people don't go anyway, but offshore too where the mouth of the canal is. Dumping sewage into the Alawai Canal is by no means an ideal situation, but it was a stopgap measure. Well, it got a lot of terrible publicity. You know, here is this major resort area and its water is dangerous. You can't go in the water, meaning offshore in the ocean. Um, that is a rather bizarre part of the Alawai Canal story that uh, certainly is not a good mark on any of us here that this was allowed to happen. For Waikiki in general, the changes to the environment, um, it's not only the Alawai Canal, but it's also the disruption of sand that is particularly unfortunate because we need a beach there for people to go to. Altering the natural environment sometimes may look like it's a uh, productive and um, good thing to do, but it may have other consequences that you can't tell at the time that you are going to regret later on. Periodically there's been discussion about building another bridge across the canal. And that bridge, if it was ever to be built, would be built so that it would connect with University Avenue on the Mauka side. And one of the interesting things that's happened every time this subject has come up, because the traffic in Waikiki is very tight sometimes, and the two bridges that exist in Macaulay Street and Kalakaua Avenue can be bottlenecks. If this other bridge was built, in theory that could improve the traffic, but there's always been an objection to the aesthetics of what that would do. And people have objected to the idea of putting another man-made structure 
across this expanse of the canal because the canal is scenic without anything interrupting it. So to build something that would interrupt that long uninterrupted vista that the canal offers now is something that people have objected to. And I think that's an interesting point that people see the canal as an asset in terms of the way it looks and they don't want to mess with that. Mm -hmm.